kind of robot in this talk, and it's a robot that many of you here have programmed. You have several of these here at U of T. And this is the crazy fly. It's an instance, and uh, a particularly good instance, of a highly resource-constrained robot. Not all robots are like this, of course. Some are very resource-rich. This one is at one end of the spectrum. It's very small, just 10 by 10 centimeters, less than 30 grams. Um, it has no GPU, which doesn't automatically mean that all hope is lost. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, it has a very modest CPU, um, a small amount of RAM. The advertised lifetime in the air is a few minutes, and typically you fly for about four to five minutes with these. If you're lucky, maybe six or seven. It does have a fast IMU. It has a respectable IMU, which you generally, in a single credit fashion, in a best effort fashion, try this update from as fast as you can. Um, I'll say this once right at the beginning. I'm going to show some experimental results. All our results are going to be in a facility much like this one. We're going to be operating inside a Vicon system. So we are getting position velocity data from the Vicon at about somewhere between 50 to 100 hertz. Okay. And it's not a constant rate either. Okay. So all of this is on board. That is the one off-board piece that we're going to rely on. Okay. There's going to be no computer vision in this talk. We're going, to, we're going to do attitude stabilization. We're going to program vehicles to achieve goals, um, to not hit each other. But it's all going to be based on knowing where they are. Uh, based on all right. So my journey on this begins some time ago. So I'm going to use this as a preview. So about eight years ago, in collaboration with Nora Anian's group, who was then at USC, um, her group and mine wrote a series of papers together on coordinating fairly large-scale crazy fly swarms to do coordinated planning at scale to do things like this. Right. So these are vehicles that are stuck in a situation where there's a known obstacle distribution. You do some offline planning. The planning is sensitive to things like downwash. It's sensitive to where the obstacles are. It's fast enough that within a few seconds, 30 to 45 seconds on a, on a modest machine, you can generate plans that sort of achieve things like this. Right? This is just one example. Right? Um, this is obviously fully centralized. Right? So you know where the obstacles are. You know where you begin. You know where you want to end up. You get a little bit of time to develop a plan, and then you enact the plan. Right? Um, the reason we did this was to show that you can, in fact, do planning at large scale. That it's possible in modest amount of time to do planning at large scale. So you can, in fact, do big size swarms, right? We would typically fly between 40 and 50 vehicles at a time. But in practice, um, one can also do this with, with significantly more vehicles. We, at the time, didn't have more vehicles. But in simulation, we would fly up to about 200 of these. And in reality, about 40 of them. And the process here is fairly simple. You do planning on a graph, you generate course trajectories, and then you do iterative refinement of these trajectories using a fast QP solver. And that's basically the underlying magic. There's some interesting other things that we had to deal with when it comes to stacking robots one on top of the other, building a downwash aware model so as, to, so as to not fly directly under each other and things like that. And this works. This works for complex geometries. It works for spaces that are very obstacle dense, um, you know, you, you can generate plans efficiently. Right? Um, now, the reason I'm showing you this is because this sort of got us thinking a few years ago, about seven or eight years ago, to whether it was possible to ever end up with a system where one could learn to do this task. So is it possible to take a swarm of aerial robots that are at known initial positions and have them go to some positions you want them to go to, much like this, the thing I do. Except instead of presenting a known obstacle distribution and building a plan, I would present the obstacles on the fly and have the vehicles simply fly to their goals while doing what you expect a swarm to do in this case, which is to avoid the obstacles and to avoid each other. And so the question is, can one learn such a controller so that one doesn't have to do offline planning every time a setup like this happens? There's a completely viable other school of thought that says you should just make your incremental planner faster so that, in fact, there will be no need to think of this as an offline exercise. You should be able to replan on the fly. And robotics has a rich history of incremental fast online planning. So I want to acknowledge that it isn't the case 
that that field of literature doesn't exist. This was an exploration that we thought would be interesting to do as a counterpoint to the way we did things then. It's very important to that in mind. And so the goal was simple. The goal was to learn a decentralized control policy. Obviously, the video I showed you on the first slide was a centralized policy. Um, and to do it for swarms of similar size. Right? And uh, we would expose our learning technique, the as-to-be-decided learning technique, to observations that the technique could see in a simulator. And then the question was, could we transfer them to a real swarm, exactly the same vehicles that I showed you before, and have them navigate an obstacle field? That, that was the question we began with. The little video looping at the bottom anticipates the results of today's talk. And so what, by the end of the talk, I hope to convince you that we can, in fact, do this. And not only can we do this, but we can do this for a much more challenging set of scenarios than the one I showed you in the first video. So the targets are going to be moving around, and we're still going to be able to fly to them. We're going to move the targets around in patterns that the robots haven't seen. We're going to move them around on the fly, so to speak, um, and a few other things. Right? And so we'll get to the how in, in this talk. And so at the time when we began this work, sort of the use in particular of deep reinforcement learning to control entire swarms with direct thrust control and with no human demonstrations was really not explored. There's a lot of work in this area now. Um, when I say direct thrust, I mean compared to other methods, like controlling some abstraction of the vehicle. So maybe just controlling its velocity and angular velocity vector. But we want to generate actual actuated commands. We want to generate more thrusts. Uh, now, why did we care? I mean, it was an entirely curiosity-driven exercise, right? So were there some really sort of robotics-driven reasons to explore this? One reason was we wondered whether we could potentially learn to maneuver in ways that were more agile than the kind of things you saw in the first video. You saw in that planner, right, that, that robots flew very deliberately, right? We put a lot of effort into safety, and there were these safe corridors for the iterative re refinement that I didn't go into. And, and the system was not um, agile looking at flight. Maybe it's just because you know we're not very good at writing low-level controllers, and we could have done better. But it wasn't certainly wasn't designed. So the question was, would that be an interesting byproduct of a learning system? So would there be an actual performance angle to this instead of just a oh we could just do this type of outcome? Right? That was question one. The downside was that we we realized early on that the entire exercise was contingent on not doing very elaborate models of the underlying physics of the vehicles. For the simple reason that any offline training regime would simply be unenactable if the models were too complicated. We would never be able to get enough offline training iterations on anything. So the fact that you pledge your troth to doing offline learning means you also pledge your troth to a simple simulator. And so the question is, is, is the simulator going to be sort of just right? And, and since I'm here giving the talk, the answer is yes, and I'll try and show you. <laughs> okay. And so there's some, there's some pros and cons to thinking this through. And so that was the rationale for why we started to do this. So our first effort in doing this was to forget about swarms entirely. Okay. So Artem Molchanov, was, who was in my lab at the time and wrote his PhD thesis on this and a couple of other topics, studied the problem of whether it was possible to train a controller for a single quad order in a simulator and transfer it to reality. And the exercise he set himself was not just to transfer it to the crazy fly, but to transfer it to two other vehicles with roughly the same geometry as the crazy fly, but different flight dynamics. Both the vehicles were a little bigger. So you train on only one, but you transfer the three similar-ish vehicles, but certainly not the same dynamics. Right? The mass inertia parameters are all different. The rotor rot thrusts are all different, and so on. And what he was able to do, I'll come back to the details of how he did this, but what he was able to do was to show that with a simple simulator, a simple model of the physics, and I'll show you the model in a second, and reasonable amount of domain randomization, he was able to train a system, a reinforcement learning system, using a simple variant of PPO, sort of a basic PPO algorithm to do what is shown in this video, which is stabilization and trajectory tracking. So that was, that was basically the outcome here, right? And 
the control is very agile, as you can see. Uh, I mean, the, the vehicles are, are, are remarkably robust. Um, you can do all kinds of things to them. They will, they will recover position quite well. The trajectories are smooth, right? And he was able to show this sort of symmetrical transfer on, on uh, three distinct kinds of bone right? Now, of course, there are no obstacles here, right? This is all empty space. Stabilization is the only goal, right? And this is single robot only, right? So this work appeared about four years ago. So this is our first foray into a learned controller just for stabilization. So based on this, we have sort of built out now a system that does the problem, that solves the problem that I mentioned earlier. And that's the subject of the rest of the talk today, right? If you're interested in the details, this appeared in Coral last year. So if you want to read the paper, all the details are there. And so today is about multiple quadrotors with collision avoidance. And there are a few properties that I'm going to try and emphasize in what we managed to get done today. So as I said before, we do direct thrust control. Necessarily, the networks we learn are going to have to end up being small. Because at flight time, you're going to make a forward pass through this network to generate the thrusts. And those have to sit in this form factor of this small vehicle. So whatever you do offline, in the end, you have to end up with a small one. Right? The observations are going to be noisy, but really for a robotics audience, I don't need to say that. that, that that's a given. Um, I'm going to show you results with up to about 128 robots in simulation. I'm going to show you results with, I think our best results are with eight physical robots. Uh, we have some preliminary results with up to 16 now, but uh, for purposes today, I'll show you eight flying. Uh, I'm going to claim that things are scalable. We, we can argue about it. Um, but I'll show you some data on why I think they're scalable. Um, and I'll also show you sort of multiple scenarios. So the motivating video I showed you was really very stylized. There's one scenario you plan and you do it. But the whole point here is you learn through hopefully a diversity of scenarios. And then in real time, you get something you've not seen before. And so hopefully, there's an aspect to generalization here. Right? Um, and so that's, that's sort of the, the, the preview, the kinds of results you'll see. OK, so I'll start with the classic picture. Everyone here has seen this picture. This is from Zetman Bartow's book which is sort of the introductory picture if you want to do our own. Our problem formulation is very simple. Each vehicle in our swarm is going to view the other vehicles as just as part of the environment. Right? So that's how we're going to proceed. Each vehicle is going to see some inputs, and I'll show you in a second what those are. It's going to generate four numbers as its output, which are its own four motor thrusts. Right? And hopefully, as a consequence of, of whatever we do, this will result in some ensemble behavior that will will sort of call swarm behavior. Right. So how does this happen? Right. So we want a mapping from the state that every vehicle sees to the actions it generates. So let's take a little bit of a look at what the state is. So the state has several pieces to it. Uh, the first position, the first part of the state is just the relative position of the vehicle with respect to its goal. So if you tell the vehicle to go over there, it's differencing the, the where it is with where the goal is. Remember, we're in Vicon, so we will abstract away the difficulties of estimating these quantities. Right. Uh, the vehicle also has direct measurements of its own velocity. Um, it has measurements of its orientation through the IMU, its angular velocity, but perhaps most importantly, each vehicle sees the relative position between it and k of its nearest neighbors, and the relative velocity between itself and k of its nearest neighbors. Now, again, because of Micron, this happens fairly easily in our setup, right? Because there is a central place where these can all be computed, and they can then be farmed out to each vehicle as though the vehicle was making the measurements locally. In practice, making these measurements locally on a small vehicle is completely completely unsolved, right? There is no magic technology that omnisciently looks in a small neighborhood around you and can, can magically give you these quantities. You can get estimates of them. They're going to be, they're going to be incomplete. They're going to be very noisy. So some of what we build on is, is, is the result of having access to these kinds of measurements. So there's some work here to be done for future iterations to really robustify this, um, to take it out in the field, for example, and things like that. OK? Um, for the entire purposes, for the purposes of this talk, k will always be a hyperparameter, the size of the neighborhood, right? 
obviously, my claims to decentralization critically depend on this value k. Leaving aside the issue that we collect data centrally but farm it out to pretend we're decentralized, leaving aside that issue, we're only going to be decentralized if k is not like roughly the size of n, where n is the number of vehicles, right? So you should ask me at the end of the talk whether I showed you any results where k is substantially smaller than n. Right? <laughs> Other, otherwise, this is not going to hold up, right? Um, and so, so that's just something to keep in mind. Right. Uh, I didn't realize there was a very fancy animation here. Maybe I should have played it. But all right. And the goal is to produce on each vehicle four numbers, right? Four thrusts, four to four propellers. Oh. All right. I promise not to step through animations for everything. OK. So now let's talk a little bit about the training environment, right? So first, what is the simulator that's going to, in simulation, cause things to fly? It's about the simplest model you can have for vehicles like this. We are going to basically program up a very simple dynamics model. Um, the simulator, by the way, is freely available. So if I don't have a URL at the end of the talk, I'm happy to share it. I encourage you to, to grab it and try and play with it. We think it's quite a useful tool for doing the kinds of training runs that I'm going to describe for, for vehicles of this time. So fairly simple description of the dynamics of the vehicles. Um, and these are, certain, these are standard. Several simulators use exactly this. But also a simple randomized collision model. So what do I mean by a simple, simple randomized collision model? What, what I mean by, by the simple randomized collision model is, in simulation, when vehicles collide with each other, we are going to pretend, for purposes of our setup, that they behave perfectly elastically and bounce off of each other. So while these are a reasonable simplification and a good abstraction of the physics of what is happening, this is a completely unrealistic model of what happens when two quadrators collide. Right? There is no pretense here that it is, I mean, maybe I can get away by saying it's a zeroth order model, but it's a zeroth order model of any collision. There's nothing about quadrators in it. And we're going to play with this idea for a reason, and I'm going to show you why. Right? Um, the simplest reason is because I have no idea how to build a collision model for two quadrators on a YouTube That's the basic idea. So the question is, should I build one or should I not? Now, let's think about this a second. I'm setting up a learning problem. If I'm going to learn how to fly and I don't have a collision model, then my learning episode ends when, when vehicles collide and fall to the floor. On the other hand, if I build a collision model, which is stupidly simple, where vehicles behave as though they're elastic balls that bounce off of each other, then I continue to run my training episode, so all the reward I've gathered up until that point doesn't necessarily fall to the floor. That is by itself not an argument that this is a good thing to do, but that's the hypothesis we're trying to explore. And I will show you that, in fact, in our problem, it works out to be a good thing to do. Right? So just keep that in mind. Right? Um, I didn't bother writing any equations for it, because it's just an elastic collision between two perfect spheres. OK. So that's the underlying physics of what drives the simulator on which we will train. So what do we train in? Like, what, do, what, what are the scenarios the vehicles see during training? So we see a mixed set of things. So what we do is we write down a set of uh, geometric shapes that we care about. We just made these up. So there's no particular sanctity to these shapes. The simplest one is just one target. This is sort of the one goal scenario. And the goal is for all the vehicles to fly there. Right? But then we do more complicated things like the circle and the grid. Uh, the names are obvious from the geometry. And the colors of the points mean the blue point is where, the notionally, the blue quadcopter is supposed to fly. And the yellow point is where the yellow vehicle is supposed to fly. So if you have eight vehicles, you can have eight goals, um, or potentially more. Right? And so we do shapes in 3D, we do shapes in 2D, we do the single goal thing. The single goal thing is obvious because you want them to, you want them to try to fly into each other and you want to see if they learn not to. Right? So there's an obvious reason why. So there are a pool of geometric shapes. And so then what we do is the way we train is we train first, we train in a, in a sort of a medley of these. And so we're going to uniformly sample these geometric shapes from the pool and train to achieve these static formations. 
So I'm going to create a static formation, and my goal is to fly to this formation. That is, achieve these goals and hang out there. Right? That's what I mean by a static formation. We're also going to do dynamic formations. So we're going to pick one of these formations. We're going to train to fly there. And then halfway through the training regime, we're going to say, oh, I've changed my mind, fly to this formation. And so we'll change the formation. So fly from one to the other. Right? And we'll do, we'll do this randomly during training. Right? So the vehicles see this unexpectedly and have to react to it. Right? And then we have sort of variants of this. So we'll do things like swap goal. So four vehicles have to go to four goals. Four vehicles have to go to some other goal. And at training time, sometime we'll randomly say, oh, we've changed our minds. Your goals are now swapped. So to try to get them to sort of fly through each other, if you will, right? We also do things like dilate and contract these formations. So we, we want to make this so that it's invariant to size. So you don't want to learn to fly in a circle of some radius. You want to learn to just fly to the goals you're set. So we'll, we'll grow these things and, and make them small. We also do some things where We'll pick that one that one goal scenario and just move it around, which will cause a swarm to try to hopefully we'll learn to follow this without hitting each other. So we'll do a bunch of these mix and matches, right? And that will be our training regime, right? And we'll do this in a in a way that is hopefully randomized enough that over time we'll have seen different instances. It'll never be possible for us to show every possible state transition or every possible instance, but what I'll show you is that over time we can learn what looks like fairly robust control of this. OK, so now let me talk a little bit about, so you know now a little bit about how we model the physics. You know the environmental training setup. So let me talk a little bit about reward design. This is going to be a RL setup, so we need to know something about the structure of the reward. So the structure of the reward, it looks a little complicated, but it is not. Um, the obvious thing is there's a penalty for being far away from the goal. So because fundamentally, this is all going to be about each vehicle needs to get to some goal at all times. So there's a penalty for being far away. The next two terms, so this is a hard collision penalty. This is a soft collision penalty. The soft collision penalty is over the k-nearest neighbors. And it basically says if you get very close to your k-nearest neighbors, there's a very sharp penalty. Of course, if you collide, there's a hard penalty. And then there's really no penalty for things that are far away. Yeah. Do I understand correctly you have a different policy for each for each of your drones in the end, just to make sure they reach the different goals? No, because the goal is an input. And so the uh -huh. policy is you learn only one policy. Uh -huh. All enacting the same place. Yeah. And there's a goal will be an input at real time. So there's a how far away is far is a hyperparameter here that we tuned based on based on what we do, and so and and the shape of how we pick this sort of nearest and nearest penalty is sort of made up. It's linear in our case; it doesn't have to be, right? The these three terms are from our single quadrotor. So the video I showed you of Artem torturing one quadrotor was made up entirely only of this. So our first foray was to learn attitude stabilization. And our swarm work really just adds a soft collision penalty, a hard collision penalty, and a distance to go penalty. And that's the only difference between these two setups. Okay. Um, so we've managed to convince ourselves that this is quite minimal. Maybe that's not quite the right word to use when you do so many things. But we think it's, it's fairly minimal. We think we have a we sort of an Occam's razor type argument for why each term should exist, and no less will do. So, so we think this is close. By the way, these are fairly clear. You don't want to spin at high angular rates, so you want the vehicle not to spin at high angular rates. You want to generate low motor torques, so these are the outputs. So you don't want to generate very high thrusts, right? And you want to be upright. That, that, that's basically the attitude of civilization. OK? So, so now you know a little bit about how that single rotor work was done. Right? That it's a subset of this work. OK. All right. So now, what's the training setup? We have to learn a policy. Um, we maximize the expected sum of a discounted reward. You know what the reward looks like. Um, we Exactly like the single rotor work, we basically use PPO. The, the policy is parameterized by a neural network. 
Um, we're going to experiment with a couple of different neural networks, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why. Um, and so there are a couple of things we want to study with this. So how do you treat your neighbors in this setup? Uh, I, sh I showed you what, what, the, what the overall setup is and what the training is going to look like. But how do you parameterize this policy yeah, architecturally? Um, the, there, are, there are several competing alternatives. So let me, let me talk you through a couple of choices and why we made them. And then we can look at the results in the context of these choices. Okay. So, so one way to do this, the, the first thing to keep in mind is so you have key neighbors that are near you. Your state as a single vehicle is not only your state, but you get to measure the relative distance and the relative velocity to these key neighbors. Right? So one thing that sort of jumps up is there's no particular reason for neighbor one versus neighbor two to be more important, at least, at least not immediately, though you could probably think of reasons why, and I'll tell you in a second why. But if you want sort of permutation invariance, you don't care about the order in which you see measurements from them, then there are several ways of doing this. One of the ways that people canonically try to do this is to take the neighbor observations, build a low-level embedding of these observations, and then sum those embeddings, which is, which is a mean operator, which is permutation invariant, and use that in conjunction with the self-observations to then predict metrics. Right? This is sort of a deep sets type technique, right? and it's been around for a while. So this is one architecture that we experimented with. Right? But I suspect about half of you already sort of figured out that you sort of need permutation invariance, but sometimes it can be a bad thing too. So why is that? Well, if you have this setup where there are four vehicles, and these two vehicles, the red and the blue, are flying directly at each other, then while uh, this vehicle is the same distance from this one as the, as the blue vehicle, clearly the red vehicle is more likely to collide with this one. The red vehicle is certainly less likely to collide with this one. So even within a proximity field, it's not clear that some vehicles, that all vehicles are of equal importance. So you need permutation invariance, but with it, you need some ability to assign relative importance to these measurements that you're making, which are relative to the other vehicles in the right? um, In position velocity phase space, you can see exactly where the vehicles that matter live. Right? If you're close by and you have a high relative velocity relative to me, then you're more important. If you're far away, I care less about how fast you're moving relative to me. I care a little bit, but not as much. And of course, if you're not moving towards me, I don't care even if you're very close to me. So it looks very nice in that phase space. So the question is, can we learn a mapping of exactly that phase space? And to those of you who tend to do uh, neural networks, you'll realize that one mechanism that is all the rage to do this is some sort of an attention mechanism. So what one can do is, like the previous technique, you can embed these k relative measurements into, into a latent. But now, instead of just doing a mean operator on them, you can learn a set of attention scores on them. And you can hand those off, combine those with the self-measurements, to then predict the actions that you want to take. Okay. Uh, of course, the question is, given the environments I sketched, can you learn the weights of these networks to, in fact, achieve this? But certainly, architecturally, this, these are fairly well-known ways of doing it. So these are the two main techniques we study. Um, and I'll show you some results from these and from some of the others. So let's look at these results here. I'll, I'll talk you through these. So I described sort of two techniques, this sort of so-called attention technique and the so-called deep sex technique. Right? Um, there are a couple of other techniques we implemented as well. We implemented the sort of the obvious naive case, which is you don't pay any attention to your neighbors at all. So you completely hide neighbor observations from the input. And that's the so-called blind system, so no neighbor observations. And then we also implemented one other technique, which is we just use a multilayer perceptron directly using neighbor observations, just like we use self-observations. So you just treat all those observations as one thing. Right? And so we think it's a sort of a middle ground between being blind to neighbors versus doing something specialized for the neighbors. Right? So there are really four cases here. Right? So, so those are listed here. So let's look at the graph on the left. 
on each of these axes, uh, on each of these graphs, on the x-axis is uh, is training in simulation. So you can see we go up to about a billion steps in in training. Um, so on the picture on the left, it's a graph of how reward behaves as a function of simulation time. And so you can see early on sort of none of the techniques are very good at gathering reward, but over time they become good at it and then at some point they saturate, right? Which is sort of the classic first graph you show for any sort of RL type. type. Um, I, I mean, as expected, sort of the blind technique is not as good as the others in accumulating rewards. I'm not a big fan of these reward pictures anyway because ultimately what matters is what you learn. You can be a reward soaking up machine and learn the entirely the wrong thing if the reward is poorly designed, but it's the first sanity check, so, so that's what it looks like. We're not going to draw any major conclusions from that. Right? We can look at average distance to target because after all, any, any behavior here, there's a well-known goal for each vehicle, and so you can measure the distance between the vehicle and the goal, and you can see how that behaves over time. Right. And over time, that should go to zero if you get it exactly right. Maybe. Because mm -hmm. if we get two vehicles to fly to the goal, then by definition, it can't go to zero for both. Otherwise, some other metric is going to break, the collision metric. So there's some subtlety there. But it should go down to some small number. Right. And so you can see it does for all four. There's some minor differences, like, like again, the naive technique and the blind technique and the MLP technique are not as good. And we have some statistics to show that. But, but they all seem to behave pretty reasonably. Certainly, it doesn't seem easy to draw any conclusion between the attention mechanism versus sort of just the permutation invariant mechanism, right? It doesn't seem to be much difference between them. Um, and then if you look at the fraction of how long the vehicles spend in the air, normalized to one for the episode, you can see that in the beginning of training, they basically never get off the ground. And then you get some sort of transition where almost all these techniques quickly learn to fly. And so this is the phase where you're essentially learning to fly. And once you've learned to fly, then you stay in the air much of the time. Right? So again, they behave pretty sensibly. Right? But if I was to draw any conclusions from this, I would more or less draw the conclusion I listed on the top, which is in terms of performance, there's not much to say between the attention mechanism versus turning it off. You'd certainly want one of them running. You probably don't want to go with just the blind technique. It's clearly not that, not as good as the others, and maybe not even just the just treating all observations the same. But there's really not much to much to uh, conclude from here. This is an example of how to evaluate a learned system badly, because you could stop here and say oh, it doesn't really matter. But in fact, it's a great example of how to evaluate a system badly. Because there's another way to evaluate the system, right? So here, on the leftmost picture is, again, simulation steps on the x-axis. But on the y-axis, I'm going to plot the number of collisions per minute, right? And if you plot this, you can very clearly see that, first of all, abandoning neighbor observations is a very bad idea, right? There is no contest. I mean, this is, this is the... This is a straw man, and obviously should not be used. You should be using one of these. Okay. Um, but that's sort of across many training scenarios. What if we picked a training scenario that was more aggressive, which is this sort of pursuit evasion scenario, where there's one goal, it's moving around in a trajectory that the vehicles have never seen, and at test time, they're asked to track and all achieve that goal without hitting each other. So what, what do these systems look like then? Like this is a good stressor for the system, right? And here you can see that they really separate out, right? The, the attention mechanism clearly now dominates. It has the lowest number of average collisions by far. I mean, we didn't just eyeball these. There are some numbers in the paper. Um, and in fact, even if you look at just the, 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 the one goal, and all of them have to fly to it, and I don't wiggle the goal around, you can see that paying it, not paying attention to your neighbors is not an option. Sort of poorly paying attention to your neighbors is a little better, but paying sort of an attention-based system to your neighbors actually wins out, right? So there's a clear winner. So, so, so it's important when you build these systems to sort of really ask, reward achievement is not the goal. Flying the robots at high performance is the goal. Reward is 
the designer's proxy for what they think might cause the system to learn the behavior. But simply reporting on reward is not enough, right? Maybe I'm belaboring the point, but I'm, 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 I'm occasionally annoyed by this, so I, I, I thought I should say it. Okay, so this attention mechanism is, is good, but then what does it actually learn? So like, can we peer into the weights of the attention network to see what they learn? Do they, does it learn the thing we expect it to learn? And this is really nice, right? You can see here, if you pay attention to the blue robot, if you just make that the ego robot, then you can see in my little picture here, you want the blue robot to pay more attention to the red robot compared to the gray robot. It's, it's, uh, it's certainly the case that, that they're more likely to be on a collision path, right? The, the red robot is, is, uh, is, is the one that is likely to be hurling itself right at the blue robot. So you can see the blue robot pays the most attention to the red, red robot, slightly less attention to gray, even less attention to green, and uh, the attention mechanism has nothing to say about self. Right? And we can reproducibly see this in the attention waves. So you, you end up learning you end up learning something quite sensible. You can say, well, what if I put these vehicles in exactly these relative positions to each other, but I just hover them? That is, I turn off all the velocities. Then, in fact, it doesn't matter. It's important to pay atten to attention equally because they're roughly all the same distance from the blue robot. So you'll see that the attention waves roughly the same. Right? So you get this sort of mapping that I talked about earlier. We have some other variants of this that we've studied as well. So it looks about right in this in this position velocity phase space. Okay, let's look at a few more few more results. I said something about scaling earlier, right? So in, you now have a feel for the architecture. You know what architectural choices we made. There's some differences between them and what the pros and cons are. So now let's look a little bit at whether this can scale up. So we, we trained in our training regime always with n equal to eight, that is eight robots, and k equal to six. Not super decentralized, right? Six is, I mean, the highest you can be is seven, so, so it's, not, it's not super decentralized. So the real question is, the eight-six combo is fine, you can do what you like in training, but unless you show me that it works for for some larger n without increasing k, you haven't really shown me anything, right? So the purpose here is to investigate that, right? And so the way this works is, by the way, all our training happens in a room of fixed dimensions. It's about 10 meters by 10 meters by 10 meters. Um, the vehicles, of course, you know, are, 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 are small, um, so we can fly many of them in this, in this set. So let's look at this picture, right? So in this picture, the number of robots varies on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, I'm going to plot the number of collisions per robot minute. So a, an episode is going to run. There are going to be some number of robots in the episode, and some number of minutes are going to go by, and then the episode ends. I'm going to normalize the number of collisions by the number of robot minutes, right? Obviously, because I expect there to be more collisions the more robots there are around and for the longer they fly, right? But I want to sort of see, taking those two out, what does it look like? Right? So that's those are the two axes here. So let's look at uh, let's look at the let's look at this graph, which is the so-called pre-trained graph. Right? So what this graph shows is the n equal to eight, k equal to six. So eight vehicles, k equal to six. So a large neighborhood choice, and two hundred million steps of training in simulation. Right, and then you. You release it into the wild and test, and you ask how many collisions per robot minute do you get? And what happens is you get very few when you do the case you trained for. This is the 8-6 case. It's not super surprising. This is the case you trained for. So you say, all right, I won't change the network at all. I trained for 8-6, but I'm going to test on 16-6. So n equal to 16, 16 robots. Neighborhood size is still 6. Right? No new training for the network, just try the network on these. Right? And the number of collisions per robot minute goes up, but it's 
in general, the number of robots, like in, in general, the number of collisions per robot minute will always go up, irrespective of what you have, because in the limit, you will fill the entire space with vehicles, and they will be in a state of permanent collision. So, so that is inescapable. It's only how rapidly this grows is what we care about, right? Okay, so it goes up. So we, we feel a sense of joy, and we try 32.6, and, and disaster, right? But we say, oh, well, let's try 48.6, and it wasn't worth plotting. So in other words, the thing I trained on is really not scalable. If I just take that trained network, adept as it is in gathering reward, it's clearly overfitted to 8.6. And it's not overfitted to the point where doubling the size of the system doesn't work. It's not a bad result to be able to double the size of the system and keep the neighborhood the same, but I don't think it quite satisfies. Uh, I, I think at that stage, I'm not in swarm land, right? I, I think it's, it's not quite right. So something has to be done. So one thing you could do is you could say, well, look, I, I mean, the right thing to do is just train, right? Just train another network. So if you want to do eight robots, then you build a network for eight robots. But if your application is 48 robots, then go crank for a day and train a network for 48 robots. And that's completely acceptable, as long as you don't change the number of uh, neighbors. So train for 48.6. If you want a great set of behaviors for those, go train for those. So that's what the solid line here is. Right? So here, what we do is, if we want to run 8.6, we run the original model. If we want to run 16.6, we build a new model. If we want to run 32.6, we build a new model, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it certainly does better than simply taking the 8.6 model and running it on bigger and bigger um, spots. Uh, it's not clear whether it's great, but it's certainly better than the previous system. The obvious downside is you have to train for, so if you, you need to sort of know in advance that you will never have a swarm bigger than a certain size. And it's also not clear whether the next point beyond this is going to become sort of untrainable at some point, right? There are limits to this. So we, we didn't really try any of this. So the, the other idea is whether one can do something clever, like take the pre-trained model and just fine-tune on larger networks. So you have sort of several hundred million steps of training with eight robots. Now, you want to fly 16, or you want to fly 32, or you want to fly 40, 48. Instead of starting from scratch and training for that, can you now take the network that you've trained for the smaller system and begin training with that and simply scale? And that's this third picture. Right? That's this third picture, which is labeled pre-trained plus fine tuning. Right? And that idea seems to have legs much further out. It's not a panacea, because here, right? But what it suggests is that the scaling properties of these systems are, are a little bit different than what you might expect. You can train very quickly for a small model. You can get a lot of additional horsepower out of that by doing fine tuning out to a model that's nearly, out to a swarm that's nearly eight times the size. But that is not forever. If you want a model that's significantly larger, like you know, 16 times the size, then you're better off training from scratch. So the scaling properties of these networks are, are, are this is of course an empirical investigation, but I think asks an interesting question, that how you scale in such networks is, is a matter of how far you want to go. There isn't even a one size fits all scaling solution. We do know what doesn't work. We know very quickly that the, the small learn model is not going to scale, right? So this is part result, part part question for open end, right? It, it says something interesting, I think, about how such systems behave. Um, right. I said that already. So let's look at a few. I have a few minutes, right? I lost track of time. So here are some results on what the actual thing looks like. I'll show you some simulation results, and then I'll show you some results with the actual partners, right? So that was one where the goals were swapped. Um, here's one where there's a formation. It sort of shrinks and expands, and the vehicles are told to fly to it. These are all the outputs of learned behaviors. 
Of course, it's all happening in our simulator. By the way, you can, the simulator is quite nice to try out because even if you don't want to do this style of, of work, you can use it for other kinds of techniques. So, so it's a quick, agile kind of system. Let me, let me show you what happens with like 32 things, right? So here there's only one goal, and they're all told to fly to this goal. And you get sort of a behavior that seems reasonable, right? You, you get them sort of trying to orbit. And of course, there's no programmed notion of orbiting or anything like that. Um, and I think if I was learning fashionable, I would say emergent behavior or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll just say this is what you get. Is there a reason why they are not Ubering here? <laughs> there is, because what happens is you get a small destabilization. Yeah, and, 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 and you- It's chaotic then. Yeah, yeah, you get this sort of, uh, so, okay, so uh, in the few minutes I have left, what about robots, right? It's all train in simulation, show you results in simulation. So now what do you do? So we now do a distillation by weights, and we have to distill these models down very, very severely. In fact, it turns out that our favorite model, the attention-based model, was not <laughs> distillable to something that would fit. So we ended up actually flying this deep sets model. It's very severely distilled down. The model we fly is actually only about 1,600 weights. Um, roughly, we're closing the control loop at 100. 100 is aspirational. We actually close the control loop at a little less than that. Right? Um, in any case, there's no real-time operating system or anything. So just by measurement, we believe the number is somewhere between 75 and 100. So here's an example with eight real vehicles doing a formation change. right? So they begin in this sort of four by two grid. They're told to go to a three by three grid. They're all flying this learned distilled controller, right? Uh, they're all operating inside Bicon, just like we, we did in, in the learned setting. Then they're told to go to this circle thing. The perspective is a little skewed, but it's a circle when you look at it from the top. They go back to this four by two grid. We can do this fairly reliably. Most of our tests go on the order of minutes until it's time to land, right? So these, are, these episodes are on the order of a few minutes. Um, so here's what happens. So I'm going to loop this because I want to point out a few things here. So remember I alluded to that simple model for collisions, right? Um, one of the nice things about having that model, and I said I'd say something about it at the end, is that if you fail due to a collision and have to restart the episode, A, you lose a lot of training cycles, and B, you actually end up in a situation where you don't learn collision recovery. In our setup, even though the collision model is absurdly simple, it ends up being that vehicles learn this kind of stuff. Now, this is very crazy fly specific. You're not going to fly big quadrotors. Then they're, they're going to break when they hit each other, and that's going to be the end of it, right? These are small, low mass, low inertia systems that mechanically are resilient to collisions, right? And you can see they, they will hit each other, they will hit the ground, they'll bounce off the ground. This is what I was trying to say when, when you get these sorts of behaviors from these systems. Our earlier planning solutions, this, this part of the phase space was not in our heads. This is all no-go robotics, right? First program I ever wrote for robot, collision avoidance, right? Do not hit anything, right? Here, a simplified model, admittedly a steep penalty for collisions, because we don't want to use collisions to find our way to the goal. Maybe that's next, but this wasn't the objective here. There's just enough here for vehicles to sort of behave reasonably, even with, with collisions. Of course, you need a good matching between the real robot you have in mind and the model. But this is an example where perhaps a roboticist would have chosen to treat collisions more harshly. But by giving yourself some slack, it's possible to learn some interesting behaviors. Right? We also ran some comparisons. I'll, I'll go through this very quickly. Um, of course, people fly formations of vehicles and change their goals, right? I'll pick one. There are, there are other approaches out there, right? I mean, you can do planning for this, too, and you can do planning in real time, like I alluded to earlier, right? You can compute a Vora region around you. After all, if, if the learned system can have access to where all its neighbors are, then so can a non-learned system. And there are perfectly good techniques to say, Compute the Voronoi region around me. I'm safe inside my Voronoi region. What's the best point in my Voronoi region to fly to in order to get to the goal? This is a known thing, 
right? So we compared against techniques that others have done. Um, and I'll just show you the video for what it looks like. So here's an example of uh, the technique from Max Weller and company on buffer Voronoi cells. Four robots on one side, four robots on the other side. Each one's doing a Voronoi cell computation and they're flying through each other when we swap them. Works really well. Right? Works really well. So just sort of hold that in your head. We'll, we'll do the same thing with our learned model. Exactly the same goals, right? And ours will work very well, but it will work very differently. Right? You, you, you see what I'm, what I'm getting at here, right? And so, so instead of belaboring the point, let's just look at what, what it really means, right? So on the left is what happens when you run the sort of this buffer Mornoi cell technique. The upper picture is the magnitude of velocity. The lower picture is the, is the magnitude of the acceleration, or the acceleration, not the magnitude. And here on the right side is the neural network control. So you get maneuvers that generally, well, they're, they're a bit, when I feel good, I say our, our vehicles are agile. Others may say, hmm, uh, in a safety critical application, maybe you don't want to fly like this. So, so, so certainly you produce behavior that's different, right? Um, depends on what you're after. Uh, the, there's no reason for the environment to not contain obstacles. Because in our system, every quadrotor sees everything else in the environment as an obstacle anyway. You can fling a beach ball into this system, and as long as the beach ball is tracked by our Vicon, life is good, right? It's, it really doesn't matter. They're all told to go to one goal. You can hurl a beach ball at them. They'll sort of fly away and fly back. So you can do things that are that are reactive in ways that may be, may be interesting for many applications. Um, we've just begun work on even doing this in the kind of setting my very first video showed, right? Lots of static obstacles. In the end, we want to put dynamic obstacles in here too. So we have some early versions of this working. It's not quite as perfect as we'd like, but we can more or less do this with our learned system. Right? We can present to it a scenario in real time and say, here's a set of goals for each of the vehicles. Fly there, don't hit anything, don't hit anybody, and just run the control, right? These are all, I think, eight robot tests. We've been doing some tests with, with larger numbers as well. Um, I originally thought I was gonna do a whole second talk, but I'm out of time on the first talk. But I wanna leave you with two thoughts. One is, I showed you big networks, and then I said, oh, we just distilled them down into small network and ran them. How? Modern installation's been around for a while. We used fairly standard techniques. We've begun a new project in the lab to impose network size as a learned constraint along with the task that you're learning. And so there's some work in this area, primarily in this area that people call hypernetworks. So you want to learn the network topology alongside learning the correct set of weights for learning this sum of discounted rewards optimization. And so if I tell you how much space I have to fit my ultimate network in, I want you to converge to the best possible network that will fit in that size. We have a paper appearing in ICRA that does this for locomotion and manipulation, not for this agile flight domain quite yet. We think we're getting close, so we have it for a slightly simpler domain, and we don't have, in this paper, we don't have any results on physical robots. We have results on simplified instances of locomotion and manipulation. But we think there's some interesting results to come, so stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll have something more systematic to say about the generation of such networks for small things. So this is my last slide. So I want to say that you know it's kind of interesting that for a swarm problem of the type I described, really small models, it boils down to about 20 neurons, my distal model, right, are, are quite effective. They can fly really big fields, right? Um, I personally think that discovering such models is very important to accommodate small memory footprints, right? And yet have models that are performant. And it's not just a matter of barely learning to fly. I think you can learn to fly well um, and, and, you know, and be competitive with techniques that are not learned. One of my pet peeves is that many learning projects pretend that there are no other ways of solving the problem. We think it's completely reasonable to learn such things but you should compare with solutions that are, that, that are out there that plan solutions and are very good in their own right. There are pros and cons to these techniques, right? 
So it's important, I think, to, to, to do a fair comparison with what we're trying to do. We are interested in achieving these tasks in measurable ways that we can care for others. Right? We think the scaling performance of these opens up some very interesting questions. And we, we, we think that there's something to study there. We're launching a study of how to systematically generate such networks instead of sort of distilling them in an ad hoc fashion, right? I think the fashionable phrase is inductive bias, but this is super important. We're roboticists. We know how to model certain aspects of the problem. This is not an exercise in throwing those models away. This is an exercise in incorporating those models so one can get more mileage out of them, right? The, the basic physics underlying these vehicles is well understood, well known. We have no pretensions of doing away with that in the course of doing this study, right? And indeed, we think that was one of the ingredients of the success of this one, right? And, you know, maybe I'm just optimistic because I don't really work that much in RL, but, but I think maybe the last chapter has not been written. I think there may be, uh, it, you know, there are many disappointing stories of RL not working in robotics, but there's some evidence that it does. And I think if you do it right, there may be, there may be some distinct possibilities uh, to come. So I think there's some open, open greenfield area there. So I'd like to point out that all the work was done by Jiwi, who is the lead author on the Coral paper and some of the upcoming work, by Sumit, by Artem, who graduated, Alexei, um, and now Shashank, who's working on, on, the, on the hyper network work and several other students. So I'd like to acknowledge them, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. One could one could do a couple of alternatives. One alternative is one could say, look, this was some in some ways a very contrived problem. You want to learn swarm behavior, and I showed you a graph where they first learn to fly and then they learn to swarm. It's not clear that you should do that, right? Maybe you should build a controller to wrap around the basic physics, something we've known for a while. There are literally hundreds and thousands of quarters playing around all the time with that. Build that and then just use the learning to learn the coordination. That would be an entirely reasonable thing to do, right? Um, we've actually explored some variants of things like that in other projects. I don't think it's an either or type solution. Um, I think in our case, what began as a, a extrapolation of the learned controller because we had a learned attitude stabilization system and adding to the adding to the sort of that was a natural outgrowth, but I don't think it it means that it is by any means the only way to go. Other ways of incorporating the physics strike me as completely reasonable. Uh, so so I, I you know I think we maybe are reiterating here what others have found in our own setting, but not necessarily claiming that this is the only way to incorporate the basic. I think it's a good point. I have a question from YouTube, from Nicholas Sinclair. He says, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. My question is to, be, uh, to, to the speaker. I really like your approach to developing simpler yet more robust models. What are your preferred strategies for simplifying your computational models and simulations, i.e., how do you decide what to include or leave out? Additionally, could you provide a link to the simulator that you use to train the quadrators? Yeah, um, so to answer the first question, I think the way to do it is every time you add a piece, you ask whether it's needed. And so that's one way to, to sort of force some, some minimalism onto the design of the system. In, to some extent, this was dictated by choice, right? By the choice we made. If you want to be able to run the simulator fast, it has to be lightweight and nimble. So there's a natural bias towards not adding features to it. But when you think of adding something, it's important to ask why, why you're adding the, 
you add a term to an equation, you ask why, and whether you're inventing too many hyperparameters. We deliberately also have kept the system where there are not too many knobs to tweak in an attempt to try to understand what is really going on. So there are some, some controls you can impose on yourself. So that's sort of one, I think. Um, I'll provide the link. I don't have it. I realized I didn't have it on the slide. So maybe, what's the easiest way of doing it? Is there a? Slip it to me and I'll post it. Okay, that sounds awesome. I'll do that. I have a couple of questions. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, so, uh, you mentioned about uh, you mentioned you know methods for properly evaluating uh, these uh, systems in simulation, especially when you want to use them in real world. So I'm wondering, should sensitivity to the dynamics uh, be part of this evaluation, and why don't we see it in our system? Yeah, it's a good point. We didn't do any sensitivity to dynamics work here for the multi-robot case. But we did do a fair amount of it for the single robot case. Because in fact, there we learned with one set of dynamics and were able to generalize to, um, to admittedly, to robots of the same geometry, but distinctly different dynamics. Right? Um, that's not exactly a sensitivity study. It's a study that says that we are OK with large perturbations, or at least certain kinds of large perturbations. But it doesn't answer the real sensitivity question, which is, if I tweak this by so much, what will happen to the output? This is the classical sort of sensitivity analysis. We haven't done that. It's, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. There are also, I think, a couple of pieces to that. There's sensitivity to architectural and hyperparameter choices. And there's sensitivity to the parameters that you actually allow the system to learn. And, and how, how sensitive you are to those. The model distillation to take a big network and put it into a smaller network, to some extent, acts as though weight ordering is a way of, uh, of prioritizing more sensitive things over less sensitive things because you put away things that you can't afford to keep. Neither of these is an analysis. So, so I, I am not entirely sure whether we have a, a, a systematic way of doing a, a real sensitivity analysis for these systems. Yeah. Uh, to be clear, I don't think uh, any paper that I've seen after yeah. the yeah. final uh, yeah. uh, right. So my second question is, uh, super interesting agile behavior again. In a certain way, it's why you use perhaps the word processes as opposed to the controller and the certain ways it's communicated. Uh, I'm wondering about the fact that if the policy is aggressive, that might cause some of the other developers to react you know, in, in, in the same manner. And that sort of pushes every, uh, you know, all the power to obey each other, so it opens up to a very system. Is there any way to sort of measure uh, whether the policy is better than all of them that are confined in a single space? Yeah, maybe that's a good point. We operate always in a fixed size box, but I, I, it's an interesting experiment to ask whether we could make the box smaller and ask whether the, the gains at some point go away because we're sort of exploiting the fact that you can make space by being aggressive. That's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. Can we turn to one more? Thanks for a great talk. Um, yeah, I think the topic for the talk is big data and small models. Yeah. I can, I'm clear about small models, but I didn't really get the big data part. So uh, maybe that's the second part of your talk, but I think one thing I was expecting is the multi-task training for the pre-training and fine-tuning uh, experiment. Uh, so I'm wondering, is, have you tried that? And is it possible to train a single model uh, that is robust to the number of drones in the environment? And uh, you try that also, like, uh, is there any transfer or forgetting? Have you observed some, something like that? Yeah. So one advantage of training the way we do is uh, there are no transfer or forgetting issues, right? The, if you don't set it up as a multitask model problem, then you don't I mean, under the hood, those issues are always there, but they're not explicit in our setting. So we chose to stay away from that. Uh, it's a good question. 
I mean, you could also ask me whether meta learning would work better, right? So there, there are competing approaches. We have not investigated those in this context. We have other projects where we've done work on, on the area. But fair question. But why did I say big data? I said big data because if you do RL and you train for a billion steps, you should point out that you expose the system to an extraordinary amount of data. Right? That, that's just a, that's just a, that, that, that's all I meant by it. I think it's important to be clear about that, right? Uh, big data has always been with us. Always. It is something that people forget. Some of the smallest, most disturbed models we have of the universe come from big data. Never forget that F equal to MA is a fit to data. You will never see it derived in any physics book. It is a fit to data, big data, right? And that lesson is not a new lesson. That's something that we have done over 2,000 years, right? Um, and so I want, to, I want to remind us always of that fact, right? The law of gravitation says that the exponent in the denominator is exactly equal to 2. Who decided that? You'll never see it derived. It's a fit to data, right? And so in a way, we are reprising this theme, except we're doing it in another context, right? And so that, that's all I meant. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone. I think we're pretty much, uh, yeah, we're just a little bit over time, so thanks for one more time. Thank you.